So this morning we continue our sermon series, Resurrecting Life, talking about what it means to experience the power of God's love and of grace in our everyday lives. Normally when we talk about resurrection and we preach about Easter, it's this big Sunday and this big holiday and everybody shows up and then Monday comes and everybody pretends like it never happened. So what does it mean to experience resurrection, to experience the grace of God in everyday life? Now today, we've, you know, before we've talked about what it means for us individually, we've talked about what it's meant in our relationships. Last week we talked a little bit about what that means in our work. And today I want to talk about what that means in terms of understanding what our purpose is as people of faith. What our purpose is as people of faith. Now, to think about where we've been over the last several weeks, there's been some important themes that have kind of come to the surface that I, I want to remind us of. The first of those is that to live in a life-giving relationship with God means that there has to be a level of surrender that's involved in that. Now, surrender is a hard word for us because those of us that love control, that's hard. It's hard to trust that God is at work. It's hard to trust that there is a God who is bigger than us. It's hard to trust that there is a God who knows us, who knows our situations, that there's a God who loves us, and that there's a God that's already at work in the world in ways that we can see and even in ways that we can't. And so if we're going to surrender, we surrender to a God who is doing and working at all times for our good and the good of those around us. And to live in a relationship that can change and transform our lives means that we have to surrender to that. Now the problem that we talked about last week is, is that when we surrender to God, God actually begins to change our lives. And He doesn't ask us permission or show us the blueprints for us to figure it out. We have to trust. And sometimes God will only allow us to see what the next small step is. And that's hard for us. Because there's a lot of fear in the world that we live in. There's a lot of uncertainty. And so every day to get up and to, you, and to say to ourselves, recite the verse that we out of Psalm 23, you know, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the ship, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That God is always with us. That God is with us in the ups and the downs. And that God always is providing for us what we need in the moment. In the prayers that we pray in the traditional service, give us this day our daily bread that we live off of. So what does that mean in terms of our purpose? What does that mean in terms of who and how God calls us to live? It means that God says that we have to live with courage. Now, Brene Brown, in one of the quotes that I found for her, she says, we can choose courage or we can choose comfort, but we can't have both, not at the same time. To choose to live in a life-giving relationship with God is one that takes courage. Because to live in a relationship with God means that God is going to work in our lives and that God is going to change us from the inside out. And that takes courage. Many of us want transformation, but we don't want the inconvenience of change. Two weeks ago, we talked about how in our relationships, we spend so much energy wanting to change other people that we don't realize that we really have no power over other people. The only person that we can change in a relationship is ourselves, and that's the hardest work to do. And so sometimes it's just easier to blame other people. It's just easier to call other people out. It's just easier to make other people the focus of our energy instead of doing the work that it takes to change and transform what is going on in inside of us. You can't always change what you see, but you can change how and what you do with what you see. And that's the hard work inside of us. Now the passage we're going to use this morning comes from the book of John chapter 15. Now this is a famous passage for those of us who have been in the church and understand the church. This is where Jesus begins saying, I am the true vine and my father is the vineyard keeper. And we're going to begin in verse 5 and talk about how our purpose is grounded in our relationship with God. So let us begin. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. If you don't remain in me, you will be like a branch that is thrown out and dries up. Those branches are gathered up, thrown into a fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. 
My Father is glorified when you produce much fruit, and in this way prove that you are my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I too have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy will be in you and your joy will become complete. This is my commandment, our purpose. Love each other just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than to give up one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you, don't, if you do what I command you. I don't call you servants any longer because servants don't know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because everything I heard from my father I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you could go and produce fruit and so that your fruit could last. As a result, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. I give you these commandments so that you can love each other. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we come to you this morning, God, in this moment, God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. And God, we thank you for the opportunity to live in a life-giving, world-transforming relationship with you, to remain in you every day. God is a discipline to dig deeply, to drink deeply of the living water of life that you offer us, God, as a gift. Allow us, God, this day the opportunity, God, to dig deeper, to drink deeper to know a love that can transform us from the inside out and to trust that we, when we surrender to your love and to your will, God, all things are possible. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So to be able to talk about what that means to surrender, I, I thought about this this past week as I was looking through some pictures, and I came across these two pictures of my sons. We were in Colorado and uh, we're staying at a friend's house, and they have a river that runs behind the house. The river is kind of low. This was last summer. And the boys um, really had this idea that they wanted to build this dam. That's Zan, my oldest. And then Diego, here he is. And so they found these rocks, and they built these rocks up, and they ended up being able to block, for the most part, the water of this river. And it began to back up, and the water down river began to dry up. And I thought about this image of what it means to remain in God, what it means to abide in Jesus, is that when we surrender our lives to God, when we surrender our will to God, there is a flow of grace and love that is able to move in, around, and through our lives that is something that very few of us actually have ever experienced in our life, but it's available to us. And whenever we ask God, you know, God, God is such a courteous God. In other words, whenever we don't want to let God do something, God steps out of the way and lets us do it. If we want to be in control, then God will let us be in control and then see how that works for us. If, God, if we want to take over a situation and, and make sure that we do what we want to do, God will be more than happy to allow you to play that role. And then more times than not, I don't know about you, but when I do that, there comes a moment when I realize that I'm not God and that I probably should have let God have a little more to say in the moment than myself. And then we have a really deep moment of prayer where I go, God, I really have not done this well here. Would you please take this for me? Because you evidently can do so much more than I can. God wants to allow that flow in our life. God wants us to experience that. But that's hard stuff for us. That's hard faith. That's a hard relationship with God. But God wants us to do that. Brene Brown says in another quote that I found, it says, Our willingness to own and engage with our vulnerability determines the depth of our courage. You see, we often think of courage as strength and not having to be vulnerable. But that's not really strength. Not the strength in which God can move and do more than we can possibly imagine. And the clarity of our purpose. You see, whenever we are able to be in touch with all of who we are, then the ability for us to love others fully is, is available to us in ways that it isn't whenever we hold people at arm's length, when we only deal with part of what's going on in our life, when we only do what's comfortable. You see, whenever you do what's comfortable, then you really just say, God, I only want to stay in this area of my spiritual home because the other rooms are too tough. 
And God never has access to that to be able to use for what God wants us to do. Many of us only show up partially to our spiritual life with God. Many of us only show up partially in our relationships with other people. Many of us only show up as a shadow of ourselves to ourselves. Because it's too hard to be vulnerable. It's too hard to show that type of courage. It's easier to show strength. It's easier to live in denial. It's easier to be big and to push other people back and to push situations back than it is to let God in, to let other people. If you want to allow God's grace to flow in your life, then you have to be careful of what you ask for. Because if you want God to offer greater and deeper love in your life, then you're going to have to be willing to deal with the brokenness in your heart. Because that love is not going to be available to you if you are still holding on to the brokenness that you've held on to for years or for, since your childhood or since this person has done this. If you aren't willing to forgive yourself or to forgive other people and to let those things go, then love in its fullest won't be able to flow into your life. If you want to experience joy in your life, I hear that all the time. Pastor, I just want more joy. Pastor, I just want to experience abundance. Pastor, I just want to know the depth of what I can experience. And God, if you want to experience deeper joy in your life, then you're going to have to feel and release the pain that has lodged itself in your heart that is filling that space that joy can be in. That's what people don't realize. We ask for so little, but yet we do not release those things that fill that space in our heart. If you want love, you've got to release and allow the brokenness to heal. If you want joy, you've got to feel and release the pain that is taking its place. If you want to experience a breakthrough in your relationships, in your marriage, in your work, in your life, in your self-esteem, then you need to be careful because God's going to start moving for you to deal with that. And you're going to have to let go of all the behaviors and attitudes and actions that are keeping you where you are. You're going to have to cease being comfortable and allow God to challenge you and be courageous enough to live into it. I get on my social media feed, um, on my Instagram feed, um, one of these uh, posts every day about fun facts or new facts or interesting facts. And, and so last, actually it was on Friday, uh, I got a, 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 a post about someone who had won the lottery, right? They had won $14 million. They were working um, at, for an hourly wage at $8 an hour. They won $14 million. How many of us would love for the numbers to roll and for us to wake up one day with $14 million? And then it talked about how that person spent that money, wasted that money, and lost that money in three years, and they were back working at a lumber factory for $10 an hour. You see, many times what they tell us about people who win significant sums of money is that once they win that money, they live with the same behaviors and money management and relationships that they lived with before they had the money and the way their lifestyle and attitudes and behaviors were functioning, it wouldn't allow them to keep that, those resources. And ultimately their behaviors and their actions and their attitudes won out and they went bankrupt again. How many of us have experienced opportunities that God has given us, but because we weren't able to change, because we didn't do the hard work, because we were still stuck in old patterns and habits, you know, went bankrupt in a relationship, went bankrupt in our work, went bankrupt in our own souls because we weren't and didn't know how to change to live into the abundance that God gives us. A lot of times in life, if you're wanting something new, it requires newness in life. If you want something different to happen, something different has to happen in your life. If you are the same person that you bring to every relationship and all your relationships aren't working, then you got to deal with the one constant, you. I know that's hard to believe. If you're finding yourself in the same ups and downs of your life, in whatever area that is, and you can't seem to find ways to deal with it, I promise you it probably isn't the other person. It might be you. And if you want to experience change, you have to abide. You have to dig deep. You have to give yourself and surrender to what God wants to give you and to be able to change and think differently and act differently and live differently in that relationship so that God's love can flow through you. 
as I was thinking about what it meant when Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, abide in me and I will give to you. Just ask him what that is. I, uh, I went outside and uh, there were some guys doing some tree work and I got a branch. Now it's not a fruit branch, you know, but it'll serve. Now, if this were off an orange tree or a peach tree and I had pulled it off the tree and brought it here this morning, was that branch going to have any fruit on it? Would it be able to produce fruit at all right now? Not even. Not even. Now, if all of us worked really hard together, could we make it produce fruit? Now, I want to tell you something. Is Danielle in here? Danielle. Danielle, our children's friend. Let me tell you what. She is amazing. She would be able to decorate this and make it look like this thing where it was bearing fruit right now. Like, she could make it look like that. You know, we could tape some oranges. We could tape it. We could make it work. We could put some stuff around it. She could find some fabric. And you would look and go, oh, my gosh, that's miraculous. It's producing fruit. But it's really not, is it? Because it's no longer connected to the source of its nutrients and its power. You know, I thought, I thought about how good our culture is at taking things that are inanimate and that are dead and making them look alive. I came across this for Hobby Lobby, right? You know, we can take a, we can take a Christmas tree, and, man, that thing looks beautiful. But is it alive? No. Is this alive? No. We live in a culture in which the look and the appearance of something can fool us into believing that it is actually bearing fruit. But Jesus says, listen, abide in me. Live in me. Dig deeper. Drink deeper of the living water that I have to give you, and you will bear fruit. And you will never have to worry about those things again. How many of us spend too much time on social media looking at what's going on in other people's lives and wishing that we had the fruit of what other people have? Wishing that the inside of our lives could look as good and feel as fulfilling as the outside of the people that we look at all the time. But the truth is, if you want fruit, if you want depth, if you want abundance, if you want joy, if you want love, it doesn't come in trying to dress up your life to look like you have it. It is in the relationship with God that you find it. And it is unique to you. Your life, your relationship with God, what fruitfulness and abundance will look like in your life will not look like someone else's. It will look like what is tailored and made specifically for you, for your family, for your heart, for your life. It's not for comparison. God doesn't need there to be a world of second-hand examples of other people. God wants you to have what you need, and what you need is different than what other people need. Last week I shared a prayer with you that I pray on a daily basis that allows me to surrender every day, to be obedient to God in a different way, and to to really offer God all of my life, and to trust that whatever God's plan is, whatever I may or may not see, that I can trust that God is, is in there, because the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. There are times in my life I say that over and over and over again to experience and trust what God will give me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But I want to share this with you, this prayer. It's the Wesley Covenant prayer. Some of you may be familiar with it, but this is a prayer that I pray on a, on a regular basis that also helps ground me in my relationship with God and ground me in the surrender of what it means to trust God. And I want to pray it as a close to this sermon in this moment for you. So let us pray. And I'm going to pray it in first person. Dear God, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by you or laid aside by you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.